Hello everyone. With today's video we're going to wrap up our discussion on credit and debt uh, and credit cards and I realize that for the purposes of this subject some of you may be under 18 and have no credit whatsoever, no credit cards. Some of you may ha be at retirement or approaching retirement and have used credit your whole life and some of you may have used credit and got in trouble and now you have no access to credit. Bottom line is, we're all going to be involved or attached to credit at some point in our lives, whether it's for a school loan or a car loan or a house mortgage. Um, so the, the more we, we nail down this process and the better we're at it, the better it's going to be for our financial future and health. Today's video is uh, a review of 10 tips. Some of these concepts I have, I have uh, suggested before, but I'm going to give you 10 tips regardless of where you are uh, in, your, in your life and in your, your credit situation that will help you keep control over your finances when it comes to credit and debt. And the first one is one that I'm a very strong believer in, and that is when you place a charge on a credit card, do not wait for them to tell you when to pay it. It is so standard for people to just charge something and then wait for the bill to come. The bill may surprise you, you may have forgotten about how much you put on it, uh, it may come at a time with, that it's not really convenient to pay. The best thing you can do when you charge something on a card is wait a few days for it to post to your account, go online, and pay it right away. There's many, many advantages to doing this. Uh, first of all, if you do that, you'll never be late. Number two, you'll never pay interest because you're paying it right away. Number three, if that's the habit you get into, it will prevent you from making impulse purchases that you really can't afford. Because when you use your credit card, you're saying to yourself, I've got to pay this down in three or four days. Will I really have the cash to do that? Uh, fourth, psychologically, it puts you in control. You are deciding when to pay your credit card. You're not getting told by the credit card company, oh, here's your statement, here's what you owe, here's what you're going to pay, and here's when you're going to pay it. No, you're doing it. Lastly, by doing it that way, you're using your credit card, which means there's no danger of the credit card company shutting the card down, which they can and will do if you do not use it. This way you're using the credit card but you're never paying interest. So my first tip is always charge your item, wait a few days, and then go right on and pay it right off. Second, and this is for those of you who have a very good uh, sense of self-control. If you have several credit cards, it's actually better not to put all your charges on one. And some people will sometimes think, well, it's easier if I only have one bill to pay. If you have several charges to make and you just put uh, a, a small amount on each of two or three credit cards, it's actually better for your credit score. And the reason is this. If you use 30% or less of your credit on your card, that gives you a positive rating on your credit score. As soon as you exceed 30% use, it actually lowers your credit score because your debt to available credit ratio is too high. So if you're going to be charging several things, maybe you're going on vacation and you know you're going to be putting some, uh, some restaurant meals and hotel bills and things like that in your cards, spread them out so you never surpass that 30% of your available credit. And it is actually a plus rather than a ding on your credit report. Third one, if you get a credit card offer in the mail, be very skeptical. All right, the, the companies are looking for people that they can make money off of. And when you get these offers in the mail, you've got to look at the fine print because very often they will say, you've been pre-approved for a card. Yeah, you've been pre-approved for a card that's got a setup fee, and an origination fee, and a monthly service fee, 
and an annual fee. And the one fee that they don't charge you, they'll put in nice big bold letters on the front of the uh, on the front of the uh, advertisement. No annual fee. Oh, that sounds good. Then you read the fine print on the back, and there's no annual fee, but there's a monthly service fee, which is just the same. So when you get these offers in the mail, be skeptical. If you're even considering using them, read the fine print all the way through on the back in the box where the disclosures are required. You should not be paying anyone for a credit card, period. And if they want you to pay an upfront fee, toss it in the garbage, <clears throat> or better use it for recycling. Four, if you've got a credit card and you've got a nice high limit, never, ever, ever use it for a cash advance. And this, this goes back to the concept we spoke to in the last video about people who think of credit as if they have increased income. Oh, it's like a bank account. No, it's not. First of all, cash advances, the interest that is charged on a cash advance is usually up to twice what your purchase interest rate is. So if you've got a credit card that charges 12.9% on purchases that you make, they may charge 24.99 or 29% for a cash advance. Also, what most people don't realize is that the interest on cash advances does not begin with the next billing cycle so that you could pay it off before that happens. It starts that day. So you never want to use a credit card for a cash advance. If you need, to use, if you need the cash for something, use that credit card to pay for it. Now, if you've gotten yourself into trouble, if you've got a lot of debt and it's outstanding and you're not paying this down every month, you can use either the snowball or the avalanche method, both of which I've discussed, but you should use one of them to make sure you knock those balances down. With the snowball effect, it's psychologically healthier. You go for your smallest credit card and you just throw everything you've got at that until it's down to zero. And once you've paid that off, the money that you have been using to pay off that small one, you now apply to the next smallest one that you've got left. And you keep doing that until you've eliminated your debt. Psychologically, that works for most people. The avalanche method, which is kind of the opposite, says what credit card has your highest interest rate on it. And it may be the one you've got the largest balance on. But if you attack that one first, you will save yourself more money. And financially, that actually makes more sense. Whichever method works for you, use it. But, but use it and eliminate that debt. Number six, you should be frequently checking your credit score and your credit history so that you know what's going on and what these companies are saying about you. There are a number of uh, online web-based companies, uh, we've used Credit Karma in the course, where you can just go on and take a look what's happened to my credit score in the last week or two. Keeping in mind that Credit Karma is, is a close approximation of your credit score, it's not exact, but they do receive information from TransUnion and Equifax. And that means if you get into the habit, even if it's once a month, of checking your status on Credit Karma, which doesn't cost you anything. If TransUnion or, Equi or uh, Experian, excuse me, have, um, have reported something that's not correct, that's going to show up. And that gives you a red flag, gives you an indication. And you can jump right on it and take care of it. Don't just let it slide. Know what people are saying about you. Number eight. About 10% of your credit score is based on the number of hard inquiries, meaning the number of times you've actually applied for credit. And if you just apply to a whole bunch of credit card companies, each one of those is a separate ding. And they're going to stay on your report for quite a while. And they will lower your credit score. Now, uh, many people know that and they, they don't go applying for 10 credit cards all at once. However, 
Very often, if you're looking to buy a car and you're looking to finance it, what will happen is you will give your application to the company and they will say, you know, we're going to run the credit and see what we can get for you. What you don't realize is that when they run that credit, they're actually contacting up to two dozen different companies to see what rates will come back. And all two dozen will show up on your credit report, even though you only had one credit inquiry. Now, technically, you can write the, uh, the uh, credit reporting agency and explain that situation and request that it reduce, be reduced from, let's say, 12 hard inquiries to only one. However, for that to happen, number one, you have to know it happened, which is why I recommended that you stay on top of your credit history by using Credit Karma or some other similar uh, company. And two, it means you've got to go through the trouble of actually going through that process. And three, they've got to agree to it. it it's arduous. There's other things going on in your life and that this might not be the number one priority today. So if you're going to go for a car loan or something similar to that, make sure you understand what it is they're actually doing when they go looking for a financing package for you and speak with them about not actually broadcasting your request across every bank uh, you know in the region number nine <clears throat> if you get into trouble speak with your credit companies S call them up most of them will be willing to change a due date Many of them will be willing to give you a one-month payment forbearance, especially if you've had a good payment record up until now. Especially now, during uh, the pandemic, uh, many companies have, have worked with, with their customers to change arrangements. Sometimes, if the interest rate has just been too high and you're not getting ahead and it's not going to happen, some of them will be willing to close your card, which has got repercussions of its own. Um, but they'll lower your interest rate it, and make it more manageable and you can afford it better. Next tip, always keep your oldest credit card open. Part of your credit score is determined by the average age of your credit. So if you've got a credit card that you've had for a long time and you rarely use it, maybe it's a store credit card, uh, Every once in a while, just use it and pay it off for something that you're going to buy anyway. Because the longer that old credit card or that old revolving credit remains on your record, the older your average credit score is, the higher your credit score is. As soon as that one is closed because you think, well, I don't need that one anymore, your credit score drops because it reduces the average age of your credit history. Now. For those of you who have no credit, are unsure about the possibility that you'd even be able to establish credit, or maybe you, you had credit and you got into big trouble, went through a bankruptcy, no one wants to give you credit, H how do you rebuild or how do you build from the start? One of the best ways to do this, and it's safe, it's not going to get you into trouble, is for you to use most likely a local bank or a local credit union that you deal with and ask for a secured credit card or a secured loan. And what this means is, let's say you have $100. You put $100 into your secured credit card. It's a bank account. And they issue you a card that gives you $100 credit. And it's fairly safe for the bank because if you don't pay your bill, it comes out of that account. That account is that bank account is frozen for you to use the card. So whatever you're charging on that card is limited by the amount of cash that you actually have to pay for it if you had to. And the bank has very little to lose because if you don't pay, they've got that savings account in your name. They report this to the credit bureaus. And so now you've got a secured card, and if you use it, maybe in your, in your mind you say, every month when I get gas for my car, 
uh, I'll use that and then I'll pay it. I'll use that and then I'll pay it. You use the card, the card gets paid, there's little risk to you or the bank, and it gets reported every month to the credit bureau. You can do this with a larger amount of money and get a uh, secured loan. Uh, and this is actually something that, that I did in the past. I have $1,000 in cash. And I gave it to the bank and I said, put it in, a, in an account, in a savings account, and lock it so that I cannot withdraw from it. Let me have a $1,000 personal loan. And then the payments for that loan came out of that savings account. It was always on time. I never worried about it. The bank had no risk. And it was reported to the credit agencies. And I began to build up my credit. If you work with your bank and you use secured financial transactions, whether it's a secured credit card or a secured personal loan, that, that really limits the risk the bank has that you're not going to pay. That's a way to make sure that you can begin building credit and begin sending positive information to the credit agencies on your behalf. So this is a very quick overview of 10 of the tips that I've used with many, many people. I've used them myself. They work. Credit is, again, it's important. It's going to be part of your life, most likely for any number of reasons. So learn to use it now. Learn to build your credit score now so that when you do need to draw on a larger loan, let's say to get a house mortgage or something, you've established a solid record. And it's solid because you have controlled your finances. This is Tom Simmons, hoping that these are helpful and, uh, and hoping that uh, as you go through life, you'll be able to keep that financial house in order by following some of these tips. Thank you.